This course is sponsored by TriWest Healthcare Alliance. We'd like to thank TriWest Healthcare Alliance for their generosity in making this course possible. Hello, my name is Dr. Heidi Kraft. By way of quick introduction, I speak with you today as a proud Navy veteran. I served nine years on active duty in the U.S. Navy. And during that time, I deployed with the Marines to Iraq in 2004 during the first battle for Fallujah. I'm also a Navy daughter and a Marine Corps spouse. And all of that has led me to being with you today, currently serving as the clinical director at PsychArmor Institute. I'm so pleased you've taken the time to join me today for this discussion of military culture and what are the most important things you as healthcare providers should know about your military and veteran patients in order to provide that outstanding care we all want to provide. As healthcare providers, we all share a few key factors that make us unique, despite our specialties. We are other-focused, and we give of ourselves to those who have entrusted us with their care. Sometimes, in those moments of trust, another human being believes in you enough to take you with him or her on a difficult journey. It can be painful or wonderful or anything in between, this road we travel alongside those who need our help. And we have to be very in tune to what those people carry with them. There are so many factors in a person's heart, mind, and soul that can influence how he or she presents, what leads that person to feel pain, to experience dysfunction, or to need your assistance. Culture is one of those factors. Cultural awareness is gaining momentum as part of the way we think about mental health treatment. I suppose it's been with us for a while, even a long time ago when I was in school. We learned about the importance of being culturally sensitive to those for whom we care. They made it clear even way back then, this did not mean we needed to become experts in the experience of African Americans or Asian Americans or Muslims or Catholics if we had not lived it. It did mean that we needed to know what questions to ask. We needed to realize that asking those questions made a difference. And now, many years after I first learned that, I'm here to talk with you today about a group I know you all care about very much. A group which, in recent years, has been recognized as a culture of its own, the United States military. Just like any other, this group has its own history, traditions, rituals, beliefs, values, appearance, even language. And just like any other, acknowledging how much those things mean to a military veteran is the first step in providing effective care to him or her. Let me start off by telling you a sea story, which is what we call them in the Navy. There are 5,000 Marines at Al Takadim with no mental health support. I need you to take a psych tech and go down there. Assess the need, talk to the docs, set up a system so these Marines are covered. I see, and when do you need me to do this, sir? Tonight, with me. Convoy leaves at 0200. The commanding officer of 1st Medical Battalion spun on the heel of his boot and strode away without waiting for my reply. A jolt of adrenaline shot through my body, tingling my toes and fingers. The windows in our concrete hospital structure rattled fiercely as a huge Marine transport helicopter hovered directly above us, waiting to land. The sheer volume made communication without yelling impossible. I watched silently as our Marines and sailors formed litter teams waiting inside the glass doors for the signal to go. April 2004, Fallujah was burning and the Marine siege of the city splashed across headlines around the world. Surgical companies and the other smaller forward surgical units across Iraq were slammed with casualties. We were no exception. After all our patients were cared for, I proceeded to my room and shoved bare necessities into my Alice pack. Since there was no chance for sleep, I wrote six letters and then went to the guy's barracks to watch a movie. 
my three best friends in our surgical company, Jason, Bill, and Steve, hovered around me. I felt their worry intensely, but no one knew what to say. So we did not say a word. Just after midnight, I sat on my cot alone, cleaning my weapon by the light of my headlamp. My fingers prickled and trembled slightly, and the twisting sensation in my gut felt strangely the same as it had during our first rocket attack. It was fear, of course, but that night I refused to name it. Petty Officer Blythe knocked at my door at 0100, his Alice pack on his shoulders. Thankful for his company, I hoisted my pack, and without a word, we walked together out of my barracks and up the road to the staging area behind the hospital. A 25 vehicle convoy waited for us around the corner. Our driver, a tall, lanky Lance Corporal with a Texas accent, helped us load our bags in the back of the Humvee. I noticed the canvas sides of our vehicle and mentally compared them to the armored plates on those in front and behind us. I opened my mouth to ask our driver about it when he swung the door of the vehicle open for me, wiggling its metal handle in demonstration. Here's your hatch, ma'am, the Marine said. It's kind of stuck, see? It doesn't open from the inside, so you'll have to wait for me to let you out. You're kidding, right? No, ma'am. Before I could ask the next stupid question, a group of five men approached us. We heard there were medical people on the ride tonight. We introduced ourselves all around. They were Navy reservists, paramedics in their civilian lives, and hospital corpsmen who supported Marine convoys in their activated Navy reserve lives. The senior ranking man, a first class petty officer with a dark mustache and bright green eyes, described the situation. So ma'am, here's what's gonna happen when we get hit. If the incident occurs in front of you, your driver will move you to the right and we will come forward to care for casualties. We will meet you with them there and you both can help us out. If the incident is behind you, your driver will stop in place and when he gives you the okay, if it's safe, you can make your way back to us. He lost me with the first sentence. I beg your pardon, did you say when we get hit? Well, yeah, we're going right through heat and ending up only a few miles from Fallujah. It's been pretty bad lately. Wouldn't you say we've taken fire the last, what, five out of six times? One of his colleagues nodded. Sounds about right. We have to expect it, ma'am. It's the rule these days, not the exception. I stopped talking. I wanted desperately not to look like an idiot. I moved away from the conversation and looked up at the vast black night. Millions of stars flickered intensely, illuminating the dark canvas horizon to horizon. While I struggled to slow my shallow breathing and meditate with words of prayer, a single star darted across the sky in a brilliant stream of light. I made a wish. Our Marine driver leaned against the front of the vehicle, smoking a cigarette. He saw me and smiled. I managed a weak smile in return and walked over to him. Don't worry, ma'am, he said. I'll take good care of you. Oh, I know you will, I replied. That was the truth. He dropped his cigarette and crushed it under his boot. It's pretty straightforward, ma'am. Just watch me the whole time. If we have to stop the vehicle, I want you to point your weapon out the window, square your chest with the hatch, and keep your eyes on me. I'll get out of the vehicle. You don't have to watch anything except me. If I shoot at something, I want you to empty your magazine in the same direction and then hit the deck of the vehicle, okay? <sighs> okay, but if I'm gonna end up hitting the deck anyway, why empty my magazine? Why not just go to the deck immediately? He grinned. You have to fire your weapon, ma'am, in order to get the combat action ribbon. I don't want the combat action ribbon, Lance Corporal. Sure you do. No, I don't. Read my lips. Medical. 
I don't shoot this thing, except when they make me practice at the range. Trust me on this. But that's why you want the combat action ribbon, ma'am. Imagine how awesome it would be for someone like you to have it. <laughs> someone like me. That made me smile. Thanks, but no thanks. Believe me, if we go through this thing tonight, you'll want it. I stopped arguing. He might have a point there. The engines of the convoy grumbled to life. Marines and sailors fastened helmet chin straps, shouted last minute orders, and mounted their vehicles. My friend, the Lance Corporal, opened my canvas door for me and smiled. I climbed in, closing my eyes briefly and silently changing my prayer. Dear God, please do not let me shoot myself or any of these Marines on this convoy tonight. I opened my eyes and slid around into the chamber. The headlights of every vehicle were shut off. I sat motionless against my steel seat, the chill of the dropping temperatures creeping through me. Our driver donned night vision goggles and spent a few minutes making adjustments. We sped into the night. An ebony sky extended in every direction, and with each passing mile, new stars appeared. Starlight alone illuminated the road. Shuddering in the cold, I pulled my fleece face cover over my mouth and nose. After the first half hour, I allowed myself to lean my helmet back, focusing on the muscles in my shoulders, which felt like rubber bands under tension. Had it only been 12 hours since our first mass casualty? I scrunched my eyes shut, willing the tears to stay inside. Distracted by my trepidation about the convoy, I had not allowed myself to think about the young corporal I met today as he recovered from surgery on our ward. I remembered the tattoos on his arms, one that said USMC, and the other, he told me, used to say Semper Fi. After the car bomb that took out most of his forearm, the S and the E remained. I remembered his tears. He felt fear, he told me of going back to his unit and shame that far outweighed that fear. He went on to explain he had been in Iraq almost two months. This was his third Purple Heart. He told me he was afraid his luck would run out. I remember struggling to form the words that would normalize this experience for this 20-year-old man. And I remember making the conscious decision to take another path with this one. I told him there was nothing normal about three Purple Hearts in two months. I told him there are no feelings that are usual to feel in this situation. I told him he was going home. He laid his head on his pillow and sobbed. Our vehicles picked up speed in unison. Leaning to my right, I peered over my driver's shoulder. 65 miles per hour, and he still maintained that perfect interval between vehicles. I smiled as I replayed our conversation about the combat action ribbon. For Marines, I thought, earning that ribbon is a source of genuine pride, almost a definition of the values for which they believe they stand. And then I thought about my patient on the ward, who felt ashamed of his fear to return to battle, and who felt grief at leaving his fellow Marines behind. Psychologists who care for Marines need to understand, I remember thinking. It helps make sense of so many things. My thoughts wandered to my husband, Mike, and I remember the first time I saw him in his uniform, his gold wings on his chest. My eyes drifted shut. I finally understand, I thought, speaking to him in the dark. The roar of the Humvee's engine changed pitches whining with decreased speed. My eyes flew open and I peered outside. Through tall, leaning shadows, I discerned storefront buildings lining the road. Decrepit and broken, they reminded me of a movie set for an old Western. I remembered our Marines calling all Anbar province of Iraq the Wild Wild West. Now I know why. My driver called back over his shoulder. We're in heat, he yelled easing on the brake. My heart paused a moment, sending a quiver through my chest. Widely known as a hostile town, casualties came from heat all too often. 
The street curved to the right in a half circle roundabout, around a patch of dirt and a dead tree. The vehicles of our convoy sped up as they rounded the circle, slowed as they left it. My pulse pounded in my fingertips as they pressed against the handle of my pistol. And then, maintaining that perfect interval between each vehicle, our convoy stopped in the middle of the highway. Our driver dismounted, telling us in a low voice to stay where we were. I remembered his instructions. I turned my chest square to the fabric hatch, ensuring my body armor faced outward. I rested the barrel of my pistol along the edge of the hole in my door. I watched the Lance Corporal. He held his rifle at shoulder level, pointing it out into the night, moving it slowly back and forth as he gazed through his goggles. I was glad the blackness in front of my eyes was not in front of his. Our vehicle stopped beside a dirt hill, overgrown with desert brush and weeds. Skinny trees peppered the landscape. I squinted past that mound, making out the shadow of a house in the lot behind it, 400 feet off the road. All the lights were off. A dog barked in the distance. My driver froze, rifle aimed just left of the hill. Moving only my eyes, I focused on his face, waiting for a move from him. The dog barked again. I heard the distinct crack of a twig under a boot and sucked in my breath. The barrel of my driver's rifle and the rifles of all the other men who stood on the road beside him moved in unison toward the noise. I cannot believe this is about to happen, I thought. I braced myself for an assault of gunfire. Four or five minutes passed in total silence, camouflaged as several hours. My lungs burned with every breath, each Swallow fought with my pounding heart for space to move down my throat. My eyes, which I dared only blink at the most critical moments, watered wildly in the cold, dry air. Suddenly, the desert night was shattered with a tremendous boom. I ducked instinctually, lowering my helmet below the level of the window, and in that same moment, realized the source of the sound. They were cobras. Their big, beautiful rotor blades chopped the air, filling it with thunder as they roared overhead. They flew tight circles low over our convoy. Limp with relief, I crumpled at the waist, lowered my weapon, and rested my helmet on the door. Our driver got back in the vehicle, the truck in front of us pulled away, and he followed. He yelled back at us, well, whoever was out there, they're gone now. He grinned broadly as he looked upward out the windshield at the cobras. I leaned my head so I could see the stars out of the window, feeling the wind blast my face. This time, I did not reach for my face warmer. My eyes began to water again, streaking my cheeks with cold tears, one after another, in a perfect interval. This story took place in 2004. So long ago, it hardly seems possible. It feels like yesterday and someone else's lifetime ago at the same moment. I learned a great deal over those long seven months. As a psychologist, I learned that sometimes there were no words, and in those moments, it's absolutely okay to hold your patient's hand. As a mother, I learned that every strikeout for the rest of my son's life as a baseball player will be precious. As a proud service woman, I learned that the symptoms of post-traumatic stress are real. I experienced horror and great fear for my life, but I also witnessed incredible sacrifice, and I would do it all again. It meant that much to me, but that's a different talk. Today, I'm here to talk with you a little bit about our culture and why it matters to you in the work that you do. I told you this particular story for a reason. There is so much woven throughout it, so much history, so many values and priorities and decisions that are uniquely military, and even specifically Navy and Marine. If a veteran you are helping was thinking of telling you this same story, you might miss some of it if you didn't know what to ask. This narrative is an example, I hope, 
of why it is absolutely vital that you as healthcare providers understand just a little about those things the veterans you care for carry into your office and try to explain with words, and that you ask the right questions about those things you don't understand. It's so important, in fact, that a few years ago, we at PsychArmor were asked by multiple groups to find a way to explain military culture in 15 minutes. I'll admit to you that at first I laughed. I mean, how in the world do you start to do that? Well, you go to the source. We asked veterans through every means we could think of, what is the one thing you would want your doctor, nurse, or therapist to know about you? And they answered us by the hundreds. Their answers fell into 15 categories and became the content for our most popular course by far, entitled 15 Things Veterans Want You to Know. The idea is, just like no one would expect you to know everything about being Hispanic or Jewish if that was not your background, no one expects you to know everything about the military. The people you provide care for do not think less of you if you do not know what every collar device indicates. I promise. They do, however, trust you more if you understand how much they value the concept, the responsibility, of the leadership roles those collar devices signify. This makes them different from a lot of the other people you will take care of. All they want is for you to know that. Let me take you through these 15 things as they relate to the story I just told you. First and foremost, of course, I know you are all asking your patients if they served in the military during your intakes. Obviously, because you are here with us for this course. You'd be surprised how many healthcare providers in our country do not ask that question. So, after you know your patient is a military veteran, what else does he or she want you to know? Number one, we are not all soldiers. You can gain instant credibility and trust with your veteran patients if you ask the next question. Which branch did you serve in? Think about my story, the Marine on our ward who had been injured three times on deployment is a beautiful example of why it matters. The branches are all one part of one team, but they have different subcultures. The Marines are known for their motto, Semper Fi, which means always faithful. He grieved the news he would be sent home because in his Marine mind, that meant he would be abandoning his brothers. Knowing the services have differences in the values that mean the most to them allows you to ask about them. You could ask, what did that mean to you as a Marine? I guarantee you gain major points for that one. Number two, the reserves are part of the military. The medics on my convoy were Navy reservists. This wasn't their full-time gig. They were paramedics who had been training to stay ready and had left their communities and civilian jobs when they were mobilized for war. Their families faced unique challenges while they were away, with a lack of the support and resources often found on base. And they may have struggled upon coming home as they were thrust back into their civilian world and might have felt alone. If your patient is a reservist, or member of the National Guard, learn more about how this affects his or her story. Number three, not everyone in the military is infantry. In my vehicle alone, we had a truck driver, a mechanic, a medic, and a psychologist. Ask your patient what he or she did in the service. There are literally hundreds of different jobs and they can greatly affect a person's military experiences. Number four, we have leaders at every level of the chain of command. This is what I alluded to earlier. In this story, you saw a senior officer order me to go on a convoy, a senior enlisted medic in charge of medical support brief me on what would happen, and a junior enlisted Marine tell me he would take care of me and talk me through it. Each one of those people took his leadership seriously it's different from many other types of work 
We are all leaders for someone. We are accountable to someone and responsible for someone. It's a unique belief. Number five, we are always on duty. This convoy took place at 0200, which of course is 2 a.m. with night vision goggles, after a day of treating patients in a mass casualty situation. Understanding the effect of a schedule like that and the exhaustion that goes with it can allow you to ask additional questions about mental health symptoms. Number six, we take pride in our conduct and in our appearance. Military service members might appear rigid and inflexible with little things like haircuts, shiny boots, and perfectly cleaned weapons. But in fact, they are following long-standing tradition of standards they believe have a purpose. These are a source of pride. I had no question my weapon would fire that night if I needed it. I cleaned it. Number seven, we did not all kill someone and those who did do not want to talk about it. Please do not ask us that, ever. This is what veterans said they wanted us to know. How does this translate to those of us, particular in the mental health field, who might be evaluating trauma, including moral injury or inner conflict, and the symptoms that are caused in some people's lives? Obviously, there are conversations within the context of mental health assessment or therapy that will involve this sensitive subject. The spirit of number seven is really focused on casual conversations. In that case, it stands. Number eight, we do not all have PTSD. Some characters in this story developed symptoms after experiencing this frightening night and others like it. Some did not. Never assume, ask. Number nine, those of us who do have an invisible wound are not dangerous and we are not violent. I believe most of you know this. These are good men and women. They have experienced trauma. They just need your help, that's all. Number 10, it is really hard for us to ask for help. Case in point, me, the night of the convoy. I was so scared, but I kept it to myself. I didn't want to appear weak. Second case in point, my Marine patient with the three Purple Hearts. He was so afraid, and he was so ashamed of that fear. He let me see his emotion, but only because I worked hard to make it okay for him to do so. Number 11, our military service changes us. How does a medical provider who doesn't even like guns experience a night like this, where she actually comes face to face with potentially being in the middle of a firefight and not be changed? We are all changed. The question is how? Give your patients permission to be changed. It can provide tremendous relief. Number 12, we differ in how much we identify with the military after we leave active duty. The Marine with the three purple hearts got that tattoo redone, so it said Semper Fi again. My husband still tucks in his shirts and wears a belt with all pants. My good friend Jason, our psychiatrist, has long hair and a beard and will only talk about the Navy when asked directly. Every one of them is within the range of normal. Ask your patients about it. It matters. Number 13. Our families serve with us. My husband Mike, a Marine pilot, was home with our infant twins when I was in Iraq. There is nothing about that situation that makes sense for a Marine. When I was a baby, my mom would make audio tapes for my dad when he was out on his submarine during the Vietnam War. He would listen, tape over it back to her, and mail it back. These situations are so different and so similar at once. Every family makes sacrifices and grows and changes during the time the members of that family serve their country. Make no mistake, they do. Number 14, we would die for each other and for our country. We would and we do. My driver on this convoy was one of the Marines who told me 
He was enjoying watching the miniseries Band of Brothers while we were out there. Encouraged me to watch it. I had no desire to do that. And then I got back and someone gave it to me as a welcome home gift. Kind of a strange welcome home gift. It sat on my bookcase for eight years. And then one day my husband and I watched it. One of the episodes is entitled, Why We Fight. And I finally understood. He wanted me to watch it because he wanted me to know why he was fighting for the men and women to his left and his right. That has always been the case. If you know that about us, you know almost everything you need to know. Number 15, we all made this sacrifice for one reason, to serve something more important than ourselves. Every year, the country pauses on September 11th to remember those we lost. I think a lot about that convoy every September 11th and about my deployment. The Marines we lost, the friends I still cherish, and it's still true. It defines us, it draws us together, it runs through us all, and it will help you help us if you know that kind of blood runs through our veins. So there you have it, the 15 things illustrated by one woman's sea story. A variation on a theme, I suppose, but one, I hope, maybe opened a little window for you into this amazing, stubborn, proud culture we call our military. Please know, you don't have to remember all these or any other details, but if you remember one or two and maybe think to ask one of these questions, your veteran patient will look at you differently. You will gain instant credibility and maybe even trust that in our culture is reserved for a very special few. Thank you in advance for your outstanding work and your dedication to our nation's service members, veterans, and their families. You matter to them. You matter to us. If you have any questions or need assistance, go to the Psych Armor website or call the Psych Armor support line at 844-779-2427. Thank you for completing this course and taking that one step further in learning about our American veterans.